Take a moment, say hi to the person around you again. Go ahead, just say good morning, fist bump. Well, it's great to see each of you this morning on this cold Florida morning. Your friends up north are jealous of you now, but they'll call you back in August when you're like, it's a million degrees. And then you say, but I don't have to shovel it. My friends who are pastors are shoveling their parking lots today. And if you're a Bills fan, even though they make billions of dollars, they uh, had people volunteer to shovel out their stadium because the poor billionaires can't afford to hire a couple of guys for minimum wage. Anyway, just letting you know, aren't the Bills the one that plowed the field one year? Or was that the Patriots? Was that the plow gate from the Dolphins? Anyway, I'm just, I diverge. So today we're continuing our series on Nehemiah, getting on track. And New Year's is a great time to get on track. And uh, I don't know, how many of you have ever lifted a barbell? Anybody in here? Yeah, everybody, right? So this week I was on, uh, I have a, a bike, bike thing, and I was, I was trying to do an iFit. I don't know if you know what that is, but basically you watch a video of a person and they tell you what to do. Well, I decided I was going to try this one that didn't just do the bike, it also added weights. And so I said, oh, these little three pound weights, no big deal. So we go through, we're doing the bike part. And all of a sudden, this lady picks up her weights. And I look and she's got eight pound weights. And I'm like, okay, if this lady can do eight pounds, I'm not going to have any problem with three. So we started doing whatever they have you do, some curls and some overheads. It was great. And then she said, now take the weight and put it in front of you and hold it there. It took me about 30 seconds to go, wow, I'm glad I don't have eight pound weights and I feel like a wimp suddenly. Now, here's what's amazing about life. Even if, and I started to do this, I, I was joking last night that I was going to just during the sermon, make everyone hold their arms up by themselves the whole time. Here's something I've learned. If you haven't learned it yet, when you're by yourself, if somebody tells you to hold your arms up for a length of time, you get really sore really fast. It, all of a sudden, your arms start to feel heavy. And I got to thinking about the principle and the principle that Nehemiah uses here. You are not made to only hold yourself up. God didn't create you to just stand around and only take care of you. He created you to live in community. And this is really cool. When we get to Nehemiah, Nehemiah, one of the 66 books of the Bible, written by all kind of different authors from all walks of life. When we get to Nehemiah, what he's about to do today is foreshadowing of what Jesus is going to do and then what Paul teaches us about the early church. It's the idea that you're not walking alone. And just like God said in, uh, early in Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. By the way, it's not good for anyone to be alone. And so today, if you don't hear anything else I say, or if you're going to take a nap, Don, um, what I would encourage you to do is, is remember this part. Listen, God has created you for a purpose and gifted you to live in community with others. And so we're going to talk about that today. The other thing I want you to know is as we talk about this, um, and I'm going to direct it towards what we do here at church, but for you, these principles will work in your workplace. Um, we all know somebody who's big talk and no action, right? Anybody know anybody who talks the talk and does it, right? We all had that person who tells you they know how to do everything and then you give it to them and they never do anything. And, uh, there's always somebody like that. And so as we look at Nehemiah, Nehemiah is the third, this is the third try for rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So you can imagine that Nehemiah is looking at this task and he's thinking, why is this going to be different? And instead of focusing on that, you're going to see what he focuses on today. And so as we look at these principles, I want you to realize it can apply to your workplace. It can apply to something as simple as a study group. But it can also apply to you setting out on any new goal in your life if you will apply these three, three things into learning to take action. So our main topic today is how to take action with a team. And so that's what we're going to talk about, how to take action with a team. We're going to look at what Nehemiah says about that. Number one, define the problem, but also the blessings. Some of you are problem people, and some of you are blessing people. 
And the truth is, when, if you're a mature believer, the Bible says, speaking the truth in love, which means that not only do you have to have the truth, what's the problem, what's the deal, but you need to learn in love to understand how God provides. So let's look at what Nehemiah does in chapter 2. We're going to head to chapter 2 like we did last week, and then we'll head to chapter 3. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and the gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. By the way, this is Nehemiah's moment of realizing, I can't do this by myself. Remember, he took three days, went around, couldn't even get through parts of the wall because they were just knocked down. And he's got to be looking at the magnitude of this task, and he realizes, God didn't call me just to do this by myself. Let me, let me tell you a secret about life. God didn't call you to just do life by yourself. My mentor used to say that one of the most incorrect statements that Christians would make was, I only need Jesus. And he would say, that's not right. And I'm like, well, well that sounds right to me. And he'd say, nope, because he created us to be in community with others. You need other people in your life to encourage you, to bless you, to carry you. And here's what I also know. When you're alone holding up your arms, it gets tired. But if you're with other people doing something, you may not even notice that you do it. God created us to do things with others. And then he continues. He says, and we'll no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And so this is Nehemiah's moment where he says, I need help. And look what God has already done. By the way, compared to the task at hand, what they have been given was not huge. There was still a lot of work to do. And you're going to discover in life, as you go through things that are difficult, one of the smartest things you can do is say, how has God helped me till now? I know what I'm looking at looks unbelievable. Maybe today you're worried about something. Maybe you're worried about a situation in your life. Maybe you're worried about a family member. Maybe you're worried about a job-related thing. Maybe your doctor did one of those, I need to talk to you this week. I always say, it's, it's always better news when the doctor's not in a hurry to get you in. Right? If the doctor says, see me right away, that's when you should go. Right? And so Nehemiah is saying, look what God has already done. And then he continues. They replied, let us start rebuilding so they began this good work. So what's he doing? He said, he's giving them a vision. The walls have fallen down. This is what's gone wrong. This is why we need to do something different. And then what does he do? Hey, let's do this together. It's the only way we can make a difference. One of my favorite uh, Native American sayings that I heard many years ago is, you can go farther by yourself. Excuse me, excuse me. You can go faster by yourself. See, I almost said it backwards. See, You can go faster by yourself, but you can go farther with others. I've talked to employee after employee who works at the Space Center in a cubicle, and I always ask this question, would you rather work with a team or by yourself? And I've never had anybody say, I'd rather work with a team. Everybody says, I only want to work by myself. And the truth is, it's easier to work by yourself. But you can't accomplish a lot of things that you could accomplish if you work and partner with others. Listen, if you're here today, I want to encourage you. Find another Christian that you can talk to about life. I'd love everyone in here to be in a small group Bible study. That, that really is the place where you begin to grow and change and discipleship takes place. But if you won't do that, at least work on getting with another believer. I don't care if it's once a month, once a week, and say, how are you doing? What's God teaching you? I mean, if you don't get to ask anything else and you ask those two questions, those are life changing. One of the reasons that I love the men's breakfast is listening to the men share, different men sharing what God's doing, not only in their life, but what the Bible says about it. So do you have anybody like that in your life? Nehemiah knew we need help. And so what did he do? He asked for help. We made big changes already this year. If you didn't notice, this service is now less crowded than it was. It was not that long ago that I had visitors come in in the back, look around, and we tried to find them a spot to sit. And of course, I would say, you can sit in the front. And they would laugh and laugh and then leave. And now we have an opportunity to fill the church again. We have folks that li are living down the street, brand new people. There was a brand new couple last night that lives down the street. He's ridden his bike here because he's so close. And the truth is, as we begin to grow, I can't do it alone. 
If it was up to me, listen, think about this. If it was only me today, number one, nobody would greet you on the way in. You'd never be handed a bulletin. There'd be no notes in the thing. My voice would not be amplified, although you probably could hear me anyway here, but nobody online could. The truth is it takes a whole team of people to help you to grow. And what I want to see is people who haven't been to church in years. Maybe there's a dad that's just moved down the street and his kids are praying, God, help my dad to want to go to church. You have to understand why I say that. Because when my mom was little, that's what my mom and her sister would pray for her dad. God, would you help him to come to church? And I'll never forget, my mom told me a story about they finally got him to come to church. And not only did they get him to come, they, they got him all the way up front to the second row because they said they wanted him to get all of it. So they brought my grandfather in. And he sat on the second row with my grandmother and my mom and her sister. They're all in the front row. And those sisters were so excited. Dad's in church for the first time. And a couple from the church came in, sat right behind him. And the whole time complained that my grandfather and his family had taken their seats. You know how hard it was to get them to go back to church after that? Some of you have been hurt by church. Some of you have been hurt by church to people. But you've come here. And my prayer is that after you leave here, God gives you something from his word that either reminds you of what's important, inspires you, challenges you, maybe leads you to repentance. I'm hopeful that one day we'll have an angry dad whose kids have been praying for him show up for church and he starts walking in the door and he's like, if anything goes wrong, I'm leaving. And they walk in the door and Mary greets him and is nice to them on the way in, so he's like, well, I can't use that one. And then they brought a couple kids with him, like, what do we do with these? He says, I'll take, Danielle says, I'll take them, and they go next door, or they come up here during church, and then he heads to the back and grabs a donut. He's like, well, I guess I have to stay till I finish the donut at least. And the hope is that he comes and sits in service, and God begins to work on his heart, and he says, you know... I've been trying to do life on my own, and I yell, and I scream, and I'm angry, and I'm frustrated, and I need Jesus. See, somebody did that for you, and that's why you're here today. And the truth is, there are other people all around us, but the only way that we can reach them, just like Nehemiah knew, the only way they could rebuild the wall is with help. The only way we can reach this community is with your help. And so many of you serve and help and do all kind of things, but I want to encourage you today, find your gift and use it. Find your gift and use it. I love what John Maxwell said. He said, life is 10% what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. Number two, meet criticism with God's vision. No good deed goes unpunished. I was talking to somebody just recently who had given a car to somebody and I told this story last night, and several other people told me they had the same thing happen. They gave a car to somebody, and the person did not transfer the title. They gave them the car, but trusted them to go to the DMV, and they didn't. So then the car got in a wreck, or in some cases they didn't pay for the tag, or whatever, and the person who gave the car away was fined for doing something good. Now, if you're not careful, you'll help somebody and they'll respond to you negatively. Or you'll help somebody and you'll get pushback. Or you'll help somebody and you'll get hurt by them. I want to encourage you, don't stop helping just because life doesn't go the way you think it should. God has called you to do something. And the enemy will always use the smallest thing just to see you can't help them. I remember years ago, I got a couple people that I'd been begging to help at church. And I finally said, hey, I tell you what, why don't you open the door, stand at the door and hand out bulletins on Sunday. That'd be a great way to connect you. So the very first week they got, they were handing out bulletins. They were so excited. And I thought, oh, this is great watching them serve. And somebody came, we were at the community center at that time. Somebody came to them and said, hey, it's really hot outside. Can you shut the doors? They threw the bulletins down, walked off and said, I'll never help here again. Jesus went to the cross, and we get mad that anybody corrects us. Listen, when you help people and love people and encourage people, you're not always going to get the response that you want. But the truth is, you're not doing it for them anyway. 
When you serve Christ, know that there's going to be times that people respond improperly to you, that things are going to happen. And the enemy will put a thought in your head, well, then I won't help anymore. Why would I want to connect with people? Loneliness is so much easier, right? Listen to what happened with Nehemiah. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and by the way, the Ammonites were most likely that group that was excluded from being Jewish because they couldn't prove their background. That's back in the book of Jeremiah. And Geshem, the Arab, heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. If you think that the Arabs today have trouble with the Jews and that's never happened before, you just need to go back in time and read Scripture. And by the way, somebody posted recently that Jerusalem has not been there very long. I don't know what the Jews think. Um, What? So they ridiculed us and said, what is this you're doing? They asked, are you rebelling against the king? What are they doing? They're falsely accusing them. They're giving fake news about it. And then it continues. I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Listen, when you do anything that matters, anything that matters, it's going to be difficult sometimes. Did you hear me? When you do something that matters, and here's the deal. If you don't have any friction in your life, then you're probably not doing enough. Because the truth is, when you start to help people and serve people and get around people, you know what I've discovered about people? They're very people-y. And so every once in a while, and this has happened, I don't even know, I've done it so many times now, it's countless. I'll be on Facebook and somebody will go to help somebody or do something for somebody and get burned. My 97-year-old Sunday school teacher got ripped off. I got a phone call this week because he got ripped off by somebody who was trying to take advantage of him and get some money from him. And so here he was trying to help somebody and they ended up hurting him. Know that when you go out of your way to help people, you will sometimes get hurt. Things won't always go well. But the truth is, if you just stand alone all the time, you're going to lose the joy of your Christian life. You're going to lose the peace that God has given you. I'm not saying that every day will be great. But the truth is that sometimes when we do what God wants us to do, we get criticized. Can I be honest with you too? We sometimes are our own worst critics. For example, this new year, some people have thought, I want to get promoted at work. But I don't have the right you fill in the blank. The enemy will plant those thoughts in your mind to discourage you. Maybe it's, I've always tried to lose weight, but why is this going to be any different? Maybe you have an anger problem that you struggle with. Maybe you've decided that you need to go to counseling and get some help. And it's easy to say it's too hard and quit. Sometimes we're our worst critic. The person that keeps us from serving is in the mirror. And so we have to say, God, what do you want me to do? And then do it. So what has God gifted and called you to do? First Corinthians, I read this to the kids. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Different kinds of working, and that's the word for energy. But in all of them and in everyone is the same God at work. This week I was on a Disney blog and because, you know, apparently I have nothing to do. But anyway, I was on a Disney blog. Just, I was just listening to what people were saying. And the question was asked, if you're a Disney employee, is the magic of going gone? And over and over they said no. And one of them said the most interesting thing. They said, you know, working at Disney, sometimes people are mean and rude about the dumbest things. The littlest inconvenience. There are people who are freaked out. And then there's other people who are nice even on a rough day. And this person said the coolest part is, uh, they said they work in the is confectionery. Is that how you say candy store? They work, they give out ice cream, right? And what a great job that would be, right? So, but they said when they go back to the park and look around, they realize, you know what? Not only does it still feel magical to me, I'm a part of making that happen. Disney's not a big deal to you. Disney's not a big deal to me. But people getting into heaven and people being inspired and encouraged week after week in this church are a big deal to me. 
You're here because somebody used the gift God gave them for you to be here this morning. And so I just want to encourage you to do that for other people. Are you glad you came today? I hope if that's true, that you'll start to say, okay, God, I want to help other people to come. And we work as a team in order to do that. No one person rebuilds the wall. We all do our part. Some people are up here singing. Other people are running the sound in the back. Onda actually came last night and this morning. She gets extra credit. Number three, focus on participants, not spectators. What does that mean? You, you don't need to focus on others no matter what. Sometimes, you ever focus on somebody who's really successful and you think, well, I can never do that? It was really hard when I first became a pastor because I would listen to other pastors and every one of them sounded like this. And they all talked like this. And when God's word in Nehemiah says, and I realized I couldn't do that. You know what God told me? Just be you. And that's what God would show you. Just be you. Let God use the gifts he's given you. Let him use who you are. You don't have to be like everybody else. I used to love to ski. And I had surgery a few years ago. And it has messed up my ski. And I can't ski anymore. So I had to figure out something. So the last time the girls wanted to go skiing, we went to a ski slope. And I said, I'm not going. It's a waste of time for me. It's a waste of money for me. I'm not going. But then I found snowmobiling. Oh, it's the best. For those of you who've never been to snowmobiling, I'm going to describe it for you. It is hiking without work. Awesome. You remember those hikes you took where you sweated and you thought, this is miserable? Not so. Snowmobile? You're passing the people hiking. You get up to the top, you got a little cooler, you pull out your water, you drink it. But guess what? I can't do what I used to do, but I can do what I can do now. Listen, you may not be able to do what you used to do. Maybe there was a ministry you were in before that's not available anymore. Guess what? Maybe God's not calling you to that. Do you know why Jesus washed his disciples' feet? This is huge theology. This is deep. You're going to remember this the rest of your life. This is so deep. You know why he washed their feet? Because they were dirty. So how do you find out what God wants you to do? Look at what's not being done. Don't just say, well, when they finally get the thing I want, then I'll do it. That's not what God calls us to. If Jesus washed his disciples' feet and said, this is an example to you, then we should say, where is there a need? Maybe it's in your neighborhood. Maybe it's in your workplace. I know there's some here. You know, I look at all the different teams here. By the way, if you want to be a part of a team here, on the back is our church phone number. If you text Diane and say, I'm interested in greeting, I'm interested in passing the offering plate, I'm interested in helping with the sound, I'm interested in helping with the sound, I'm interested in helping with the sound. (laughs) Did I say that three times, Sonda? Do you get extra credit? If you text her and tell her that, she will get back to you and tell you who to call, how to get lined up, how to find out about how to get trained and ready to do whatever it is you're called to do. But I want to encourage you not to just sit and soak because you'll be miserable. And over time, you'll become a country club Christian where your job, you think, is to criticize all the other Christians. So don't. Focus on that. Focus on what God's called you to do. Listen to what happens next. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, which was, by the way, a few miles away, and they came into town. But their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. I don't want you to raise your hand on this, but we all know somebody who's lazy. We all work with somebody who gets a paycheck, and we go, how? If I did that, I'd be fired tomorrow. How are they able... You know that guy? It's not you. I know that. I'm not pointing at you. All right. But the truth is, we all know somebody like that. Well, that's what was happening here. A few verses later, it says, Rephiah, son of Hur, ruler of the district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section. Adjoining this, Jedediah, who later was on the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, They said, California is the place you ought to be. (laughs) Look at this name. Son of... Doesn't that sound like the noise you make when you sit down? All right, sorry. Made repairs opposite his house and then Hattush, 
You know, so they made fun of that name. That guy in junior high was in trouble. Probably called him Tushy. Hattush, son of Hezbaniah, made repairs next to him. Malchijah, son of Haram, and Hashub, son of... See, wouldn't you like... Aren't you glad you're like Joe and Jim? They repaired another section of the Tower of Heaven. Now listen to this. Shalom, son of Halesh, ruler of the Hashdash of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. The truth is, in God's economy, God has a place for everyone. And even way back in the Old Testament, back in this time where many cultures considered women property, here the Bible is pointing out this guy got his daughters. Not only did they live with him, they helped him. They worked with him. They helped repair the wall. Don't let anyone tell you that God has not called you to do something. The enemy will try to convince you that you're too busy, you're too lazy, you're too sick. But the truth is, we just have to say, God, what do you want me to do? And then do it. I love at our church, all of our seniors who have done so many things to reach out. People who have been told many times, maybe they're too old to do this or that or the other, but they just go out of their way to serve. John Maxwell told a story years ago about when he was a pastor. And he said, I always thought of what churches do to pastors sometimes. And he said, it would be like a football team. And today is more playoff games. So it'd be like a football team. And so you see the Bills coming out to the field today. And their coach, they run out behind their coach, right? And the coach gets them in a circle. And he gets them all fired up. And he says, all right, let's go. And then all the players go and sit on the bench. And they say, okay, coach, you go. And the coach goes out and he's on offense. So he hikes the ball to himself. That's about as far as he gets, right? Because what happens if you play bat football against 13 people? Is it 13? 11 people. My team always had 13. That's why they did better. You hike the ball to yourself. Those 11 people are going to smash you. That's the end. The truth is, if we're not careful as Christians, that's what we think. Hey, let the professionals do it. But that's not what God calls us to. The reason that one of the reasons that Nehemiah's building program worked after two failed attempts was because other people said, you need help? We're going to help. Today, I want to challenge you. What's God calling you to do? And do it. Begin reaching out and saying, what is needed? And begin asking God to show you what to do. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service or if you're watching online, I'd be glad to communicate with you if you want to text me or message me. But if you never had a relationship with him, today can be the day. If you're here today and you don't know what God wants you to do, maybe something you used to do, you can't really do it right now. Well, then find another place to serve and maybe God will use even that serving to open up other doors. Just pray about it. We're going to close in prayer today. Would you join me? Father, thank you for this time this morning. I thank you for your word, your power, your strength. Father, I pray for each of us that we would find the gifting you've given us, look for the needs around us, and serve joyfully. Father, thank you for all those who serve every week. Lord, I thank you for a church that people understand and are looking for opportunities to bless our community, to show others the way home to you. Lord, I pray this year we would see many come home to you. Lord, do what only you can do in our lives. In Jesus' name.